Welcome to B News Weekly. I'm Phil Gallagher, along with B News reporters Greg Walsh, Tad Stefanak, John Vias, Chris Flaherty, Peter Brown with the weather, and Juliana McGrain with the community calendar. Thank you for joining us. Just what is the future of life sciences in Burlington? Apparently, it looks like a bright one. The Burlington Area Chamber of Commerce presented a conversation on life sciences in the suburbs during a special panel discussion on October 18th at the Northeastern University Innovation Campus. The event was moderated by life science expert Dina Wassoff, a Burlington resident and town meeting member. Common themes for the discussion were workforce transportation and the hope that the government continues to invest in the life sciences industry. Let's have a look. The Burlington Area Chamber of Commerce recently gathered a panel of Burlington and state officials as well as local biotech and healthcare representatives at the Northeastern University Burlington campus for discussion on the status and future of life sciences in Burlington. I think today's uh, event was great. It's, it's a conversation, an open com conversation. We've got a great group of panelists, our business panelists, they all have different experiences, but the common themes are workforce transportation and making sure the government continues to invest in the life science industry. I thought it was a great discussion. Uh, always great to be with two of our great legislative partners, Rep. Vargas and Rep. Gordon, and a great collection of business, academia, government, the healthcare system, the town, the state. It's really how we get things done around here. Burlington's done a great job in life sciences. We have great opportunities ahead. We get some challenges around housing costs, but we hope to remain the global leader in life sciences, and today is a great example of that. We've got to look, continue to look into improving transportation because we've got to have the public transportation system vibrant and we have to have our roads and bridges in functioning shape. So we'll continue to look at that. And then housing. This is a state where housing is, is a challenge for employers. When they come in here, they look at that. Where am I going to put my workers? And so we've got to continue to look flexibly at where are we going to provide that housing for our for our workers to keep our economy running. We have a government affairs committee and we continue to work you know, behind the scenes. We have a very good relationship with our, our state rep, Ken Gordon, and Senator Sidney Friedman. We're always there to hear from us. We've done a lot of work with infrastructure, zoning. Life science is the up and coming industry. You know, we're really gracious to be invited by Rick Parker, the head of the chamber. You know, we're new to town, so we really want to really be part of the community and be part of the conversations that are happening here. Butterfly is a transformational digital health company, right? We're changing care with the world's first whole body scanner that's on a semiconductor chip. And we decided to build our headquarters here in Burlington, Mass, to be a part of the life science ecosystem that is here. And we're really looking forward to being here and growing here in the future. We want to make sure that the amenities that we've brought that have made Burlington really what it is continue to thrive based on that daytime population. And the life science industry will be that driver. From the Burlington Northeastern University campus, I'm B News reporter Tad Stefanak. The new DPW facility is officially open for business, and B News recently received a tour of the new facility. A key highlight of the new building is its large garage, where the department can store its many vehicles and other equipment. DPW Director John Sanchez told B News this will go a long way to keeping the equipment, millions of dollars of worth, in working condition, whereas in the past the department had no indoor facility for storage. Also included in this new facility are large meeting rooms, offices, as well as showers and other amenities for employees, particularly during heavy snowstorms. You can find a complete video tour of the new DPW facility in, on the BCAT website at www.bcattv.org. Burlington students are generally keeping up with statewide MCAS results this year, although math scores in the higher grades saw a decline. During a recent school committee meeting, Carrie Purchase, principal of Marshall Simons Middle School, discussed Burlington's 2022 MCAS results and how they compare to the 21 and 2019 results. Remember, the MCAS was not administered in 20 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Purchase wrapped up her presentation with suggested practices for the district to move forward, including a curriculum review process to ensure what students are being taught and what best aligns with state standards. If you're ready to stand up and be counted, you can do so early this year. Early in-person voting in Burlington began this weekend and will run Monday through Saturdays until November 4th at the main hearing room at Burlington Town Hall, 29 Center Street. Election day is November 8th. The polls will be open at Burlington High School from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., so there's no excuse not to be there. 
For more voting in the midterm election, it, uh, visit the Burlington. More information on the uh, on the on the ballot itself. Visit the town of Burlington website. The Parks and Recreation Department's Trucktober rolled back into town recently. The ever-popular fall event featured a lawn games, lawn games, entertainment, and of course food truck cuisine from local favorites. BCAT trucked on, uh, trucked on by for all of the action. Parks and Recreation's annual Trucktober event returned to the town common on Saturday, October 15th featuring lawn games, inflatables, a new power wheel derby for young racers, and of course, food trucks. It takes a lot of coordination between the food trucks that are here today on site, um, as well as putting the inflatables together. The Power Wheels Derby is our newest event. Children from ages 2 to 8 are able to pre-register and come down um, and race uh, against one of their peers. Um, to see who can race the fastest down Center Street. At the end, we have um, a little gift bag for them and a photo opportunity for them and their family. Trucktober has become a Parks and Rec favorite for residents and community members. I like to think that it's um, our lo most laid back event. It's not like there's 8,000 things that you have to see or do. Um, so you can come uh, enjoy some food on the common. We have some backyard games. Uh, we have some inflatables for the kids and the race, but it's just a time for families to come together, um, enjoy this beautiful weather we're getting today, and hang out here on the Common. Stay tuned to BCAT for our full coverage of Trucktober 2022, hosted by Arushi Daima and Juliana McGrain. Until next time, this is Chris Flaherty for B News Weekly. Halloween is right around the corner, and there are plenty of festive events in town for trick-or-treaters and families to get into the spooky spirit. For instance, this Sunday, the Girl Scouts of Burlington will be holding its fourth annual Trunk or Treat event at the Burlington High School faculty parking lot. Children of Burlington are welcome to wear their costumes and trick-or-treat down a line of vehicles decorated for Halloween. And please note, the time of the event has been moved up from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. due to expected inclement weather in the afternoon. Wayside Shopping Center will be having its annual Halloween at Wayside event on Friday, October 28th from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. There will be a costume parade, photo booth, face painting, balloon art, and more. The event is free. For all other events and happenings, don't be afraid to check out BCAT's website. The drug overdose pandemic in the United States is, clear, is a clear and present public health and national security threat, according to the Drug Enforcement Administration. In an effort to fight this danger to public safety, the Burlington Police Department will be participating in the DEA's National Prescription Drug Take Back Day. On Saturday, October 29th, from 10 a.m. to 10, 2 p.m., the Burlington Police will have a table set up at Wegmans at 53 3rd Ave in Burlington to accept people's unneeded medications as a measure of preventing medication misuse and possible opioid addiction. BCAT has a new news producer, it's Greg Walsh, and he comes to the station with an extensive background in both business-to-business -business news writing, editing, and community journalism. Walsh, a Bill Rickon resident, has won numerous New England Press Association and Mass Press Association awards for news writing, feature writing, columns, and photography. Let's take a look. I'm in the news studio today with Greg Walsh, who is uh, BCAT's brand new news producer, and I'd like to introduce him to you. Welcome. Thank you, Phil. Let's start with, uh, you have a journalistic, long journalistic background. Where did you matriculate? And tell us about some of your experience. Sure. Um, well, I went to Northeastern University for journalism, and uh, I really felt like I was well prepared there for what was coming ahead. Uh, there were no surprises once I, I got in there. And I started off as a, a sports editor, uh, covering high school sports, and then uh, I guess they call it graduates in news writing, and then eventually became an editor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a, a community journalist for many years, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I really enjoyed it. I liked uh, getting out there and meeting people and, and just getting the flow of the community. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got a job at a newspaper in Boston, a B2B uh, newspaper, and I was there for 20 years, mm -hmm. and there were some uh, layoffs with- that the Boston Business Journal? The Boston uh -huh. Business Journal, that's correct, yep. Right. And I was, I was laid off, uh, you know, advertising was down, and some people had to, you know, some people had to go. <laughs> well, let's, let's segue into that, uh, yeah. that question about uh, the impact of 
that's happened to the print media in the age of the internet, et cetera. Sure. Uh, and talk about that for a second and then segue into the, the rise of uh, local cable access and, sure. and its importance or lack of importance in the community. Okay. Yeah. Um, when I first started at the Business Journal in the mid 90s, basically, I mean, newspaper was king. Uh, the papers were chock full of ads, and the, the papers themselves were huge. And uh, we had a huge staff, and it was a, a very uh, brisk time for newspapers, I thought. And then, you know, of course, when the internet came along, we had to adjust. But I, I think the tricky thing was navigating between being a print journalist and then putting things on the web and like what goes on the web, what goes in the newspaper, which, which things are highlighted more in the newspaper. So it was a very, um, it was a balancing act for a long time and then eventually it became more of a, a digital news operation. A uh, result of lack of uh, devotion of advertising to the internet as opposed to the print. Right, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I, I, the newspapers, they still have them, you mm -hmm. know, and a lot of newspapers have held on and I think advertisers are coming back a little bit. I, I think um, New York Times is doing really well. I, I see like locally the Lowell Sun has a lot of ads. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, they, they also sell packages where you can get mm -hmm. ads online and in the paper to do the other. So. But for local coverage now, yeah, I mean, BCAT is the place to go. Absolutely, <laughs> if you want to get community journalism, I mean, it, it's just such a lack of it out there right now. Um, I came from the Marblehead and Swamp Scott Reporters and the Marblehead reporter had 80 pages of pure Marblehead news. It, it was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And then it sort of tapered off and became more regional and now, now it basically doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So, Well, welcome aboard. Thank you. Uh, Greg's gonna be around quite a bit. Uh, he's gonna Hope be so. a point of ca contact for uh, all Burlington news. We'll have him up with a, an email <laughs> addressed shortly. Uh, and if you've got anything you'd like BCAT to cover, uh, please get in contact with Greg and any of the rest of us here at B News and B Cat. Thank you, Greg. Welcome Thank you, Phil. Appreciate it. Thank you. Fall has begun. We can feel it, can't we? So let's have a look at your weather with B News weatherman Peter Brown, followed as always by the community calendar with uh, Juliana McGrain this week. Well, hello everyone. This is Peter Brown to watch your weather for the next seven days. Here we are. I know it's hard to believe heading in towards the latter portion of October. We're looking ahead towards the last full week of October. I know it's very hard to believe that we're almost to Halloween and we're going to be having some definitely warmer weather than we've been seeing over the past week or so. So it's going to be very pleasant out there. And next week we might get a chance to put some of our drought deficits down a little bit as we might get a little bit of rain, nothing too heavy, but a pretty pleasant week of weather coming up. And as we start out our period on Friday, we're going to see temperatures at this time of the year that should be about in the mid 60s. And that's about where we're going to be on Friday. As we head into the weekend, though, you're going to see those temperatures bump up and it's going to be really a beautiful Saturday out there. As we close at our period getting in towards next Thursday, I know it's hard to believe our average high should only be around 60 at this time of the year, and we're probably going to be around that, if not a little bit cooler than that. So it looks like we're going to have pretty significant cool down as we head towards the very end of the work week, so keep that in mind. And of course, as we notice, as we head further and further towards November, the length of day keeps getting very, very short out here. Those sunrises are happening pretty late in the morning, and the sunsets are happening pretty early now. So as we go ahead, let's take a look at what the Climate Prediction Center is calling for us here in the Burlington area over the next 7 to 10 days in terms of temperatures and precipitation. And this is a map, of course, at this time of the year a lot of us like to see. We are expecting a very good chance of seeing above average temperatures here, especially in the northeast. That's where the biggest chance of above average temperatures across the lower 48 are going to be. And looking at our precipitation chances, looks like we're just expecting average chances of precipitation. So. Hopefully we'll fill up those reservoirs and everything. Still remember, we're getting into the winter, so we want to get that water in there so that it's ready for next spring. And hopefully we'll add a little bit of that. So let's go ahead and take a look at those seven days of weather coming up. And again, starting out our period on Friday, starting out your weekend. Going to be fairly nice out there. Temperatures in the low to maybe mid-60s out there. Some nice sunny skies out there. And as we get in towards Saturday, that's when the temperatures are really going to climb back up to near 70, maybe a few degrees above that. So a really pleasant day if you have to be out raking those leaves off of the grass. 
Now, as we get in towards Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, we're going to be seeing a weak disturbance moving through the New England area here. That might bring us some light rain showers here, and there may be a little bit more steadier rain on Monday. That's going to suppress the temperatures a little bit back down into the lower 60s on Monday, but then rebounding on Tuesday as that storm moves out of here with temperatures back up near 70. Now, as we head towards the tail end of the period, as you notice, we're going to be seeing a strong cold front making its way through the area and knocking those temperatures back down into the 50s, most likely by Thursday. So everyone, get out there, enjoy the weather, and have a great week. I'm Juliana McGrain, and this is your community calendar. Friday, October 28th, from 3 to 5 p.m., kick off Halloween weekend at Wayside Shopping Center with a DJ, dance party, costume parade, face painting, balloon animals, trick-or-treat bags, and more. Visit the Wayside Shopping Center on Facebook for more information. Saturday, October 29th, from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., the Burlington Sculpture Park is hosting a pumpkin party. Free pumpkins and painting supplies will be available for the first 100 children. Watch a professional artist transform regular pumpkins into an autumn masterpiece. There will be free cider donuts, courtesy of Wegmans in Burlington. Visit the Burlington Sculpture Park Facebook page for more information. And that was your community calendar. Turning now to sports, the Red Devils football team held on to defeat the Wilmington Wildcats at Varsity Field last week, 41-35. This was Burlington's first game on its new turf. We have these highlights. The Red Devils finally made their way back to Varsity Field on a brand new turf to face the Wilmington Wildcats on Friday, October 14th. The Devils kick off the game, and the ball is caught by Wildcat number 11, Michael Lawler. With eight and a half minutes left on the clock in the first quarter, the ball was caught by number 26, Ryan Brooks, at the 20-yard line, scoring the first touchdown of the game with extra point included. Hand off to number seven, Mike D'Amato, at the 15-yard line. Touchdown red. And a third to end the first quarter by number 30, Joseph Polwin, making 21-0 Burlington. The second quarter speeds by, and the Wildcats are ready to bounce back with their first touchdown of the game. But the Devils remain unstoppable. With one minute left on the clock in the first half, Number 11, John Mello, catches the ball at the 10-yard line for yet another Burlington touchdown. Wilmington kicks off the second half, and the ball is caught by D'Amato, tackled on the 40-yard line. Resetting with 10 seconds left in the third quarter, Red Devil number 10, Anthony Garrier, passes the ball from the 40-yard line back to number 15, Charles Hannafin, for another touchdown. Extra point included, and then another touchdown. The Wildcats manage to catch up towards the final quarter, and they have a chance to tie the game. But the Red Devils go home with a victory, and there's no better way to celebrate a newly re-turfed varsity field than winning their first home game of the season with a final score of 41-35 Burlington. This is John Vias for B News Sports. The Red Devil varsity soccer team hosted its first soccer night under the lights of Brush Field last week. Burlington's guest was Melrose, who hosted the Red Devils team in years past. The night brought together the two teams along with the JV squads and youth soccer players, Galore, who hung out on the sidelines and played on the turf between breaks. Burlington High School hosted its first soccer night under the lights of Brush Field last Wednesday. Melrose got the ball rolling with Burlington some years back, but after COVID, the varsity coaches wanted to reciprocate. Soccer night, first of all, it's the first time we've run it. We share it with Melrose. We've been very lucky. So a few years back, I want to say it was probably four years ago now, Melrose invited us to partake in soccer night with them. So we went over to Fred Greenfield and they walked our kids out and they had all the youth soccer players there. And it was an amazing night. Great, great, great uh, opportunity for our kids to be there with Melrose. Um, I've been very lucky to have a great relationship with Melrose. Steve Fogarty, the AD over there, um, asked us if we would be part of it with them, uh, which was great. So I think we kind of uh, stole the idea, you know, to give him credit, I think is kind of what happened. Um, COVID came, we kind of got away from it, and then uh, Coach Dean and Coach D'Souza came back to me and said, listen, Melrose uh, is inviting us again. We'd like to take part with those guys. So we absolutely said, you know, it was such a great event last time. We wanted to pick up where we left off. Hart says having the youth programs all the way up to the varsity together for the evening makes sense at every level. It's, it's really what sports is all about, you know what I mean? You start at one spot and you hope to end, you know, at hopefully in a big, long career, you know? So, again, you know, you want the, the, the youth in the town to see what's going on here, and you want every single um, 
kid who plays soccer in Burlington to want to wear that high school jersey. They want to have that Burlington on their chest, and you want to see them out here, you know, playing and participating and see where it goes, and then hope, you know, even when they, after high school, get to go to that next level of, of, of college, and, you know, hopefully someday we, we get the next level, you know what I mean? So Absolutely. that's that's where we want to be. Having the youth players in attendance is a big plus, says a fifth grade teacher in Burlington. Boys varsity coach Andrew Dean sees them moving up the ranks early on. 10 and 11 year olds, you know, every year that come through that I kind of get to even out at, at, at a recess on the field, I'm checking my boxes on, hey, who am I excited to see in three or four years? I had a chance to chat with select board member Mike Espejo, who believes the soccer night is a great way for the town to get together through athletics. Oh, anytime we can get the town together, especially around athletics, it's a, just a good way to, to build community spirit, build camaraderie, and just get everyone out on a nice uh, Wednesday night, I guess, for yeah. uh, some good soccer. Overall, Burlington's first soccer night was a success. Everyone in attendance, and we mean everyone, enjoyed themselves. This is Greg Walsh reporting for B News. The Burlington High Lady Devils volleyball team recently hit the court to help spike out cancer. The event on October 14th featured the varsity and junior varsity teams against Bedford. The Burlington team spent weeks leading up to the game raising funds by selling raffle tickets and t-shirts as well as gathering donations online. The proceeds go to the American Cancer so Society. Currently, a total of $7,678 has been raised, including $800 raised through the efforts of Bedford Volleyball and a $200 donation from the Burlington Athletic Boosters. This week's photo was sent in to us by Mary Leach. It was taken on just outside Leahy Hospital. It's a glorious time of year, and just walking outside and admiring the fall scenery makes a person feel better, she said. Thanks for the photo, Mary. We'd like to see your photos. These, they could be of your outdoor activities, family and pets, the weather, sites around town, or anything else you'd like to share. Email your photos to bcat at bcattv.org with the subject line, Photo of the Week. And that's it from the news desk here at B News Weekly. I'm Phil Gallagher, along with Greg Walsh, Tad Stefanak, Chris Flaherty, John Vias, Juliana McGrain, and Peter Brown. Thank you for joining us.